One of the most important components of space flight is the space suit, but based on comments on the recent news stories regarding the current and next generation of suits, it seems that a lot of us don't know much about them. And so to teach us all we need to know about suits, we're going to be joined by Daniel Klopp, who works for ILC Dover, the company that has designed and manufactured the EVA spacesuits for NASA since the Apollo program. Please come find us on social media. We're at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram, and we love hearing from you. And please consider sharing our podcast with anyone you know who enjoys space flight, and then hopefully you'll both be able to enjoy episode 59 of the Space and Things Podcast. Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 59 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm a little tired, but I'm doing good. I've been busy lately. <laughs> yes, you have been busy. We're going to come on to that in a moment. But first of all, did you see the art installation, which has been organized by Christina Court, which happened in Atlanta this weekend? Yes, I did. I absolutely did. And I loved it. I, th- I think I retweeted it. Um, yeah, I believe it's a, a Na- NASA astronaut. I think it's Stephanie Wilson that it, she they did. It is. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. So for those of you who don't know what this is uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, um, there was a giant earthwork is what it's called, by Stan Hurd, who does these big uh, pieces of art using crops. And they've done this uh, big piece of art on a field in Atlanta or in a park in Atlanta of Stephanie Williams to celebrate the International Day of the Girl. Uh, and it's really quite incredible. And around all the outside, they're using um, some some children's space art to, to frame it. It's wonderful. And there's a drone shot which goes up and you can see it from above. And it's just ridiculously cool. Uh, and I, I'm sure plenty of people in Atlanta are, are getting a kick out of that right now. Uh, rightfully so. I just wanted to bring it up because I thought it was I think it's amazing. And uh, check out in the show notes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post a little link to that. But good job, Christina, for doing that. But, Emily, you have been busy. By my count, you've written four articles since the last time we spoke about your articles. Yes. <laughs> I've been a little busy, yeah. <laughs> and I've got more coming up soon. So, yeah, I'm a, I've been a little busy lately. Uh, I've written uh, the one about uh, where is the great woman space communicator. It's basically about how... Um, <laughs> Women uh, space communicators are never really out front, so I kind of wanted to write an article uh, addressing that. When I say out front, I mean like they're not like um. I guess in I guess in England you would have like I don't know Brian Cox, or I'm trying to think like yeah. James Burke or somebody like that. Like those guys are always like we're always like the ones out front, you know. Whereas or uh, Patrick Sir Patrick Moore, yeah. Whereas like the women who do that kind of stuff are sort of more in the background, yeah. I agree. Sec- so. Secondary characters. I read your article. Obviously, I didn't know many of the American references, but you did include some English references within that article, which uh, was useful for me. Um, but it's a it's it's a really good point, isn't it? What you're trying to get at, you know, historically that has been the case, and it's not necessary. Um, and it's not to say that any of the the men who have had those roles haven't been good at their jobs. They have been, but it, yeah, absolutely. But there are equally qualified women who who haven't had that opportunity when they could have had and uh and they're there they're right there let's give them the opportunity yeah absolutely absolutely and you've written two articles for celestius memorial space flights i think that's right uh let me see if the latest i looked earlier all right yeah it's up it is out okay i did not know if it was out yet wow okay did did i know before you (laughs) yes you did i did not know it was out yet wow big big fan of big fan of your work emily that's all i'm gonna say (laughs) thank you oh wow i'm about wow it's beautiful wow i'm looking at it now it's very nice. Jerry was really handsome. Sorry, I'm looking at it. It's, this is the first time I'm seeing it, so I'm really excited. It's the reason I put this hat on. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I need to buy some more of their merch, yeah. by the way. The High Frontier movie, they have some spectacular merchandise, and I, I need to buy more. I have two of their t-shirts already. My husband's going to probably hear in this in the other room, and he's like, oh, God, no, no. Like, <laughs> cut her. She needs to be cut off, yeah. but I need... 
I need one of them hats and I need like one of their sweatshirts or uh, something because yeah. it's actually going to get winter it, is coming. It might, <laughs> it might get cool here sometime. I don't know. It might. All right. Sometime in like maybe in February. So I better get prepared for like two days. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Uh, anyway. This latest article, which has just come out, it's called How Gerard K. O'Neill Reached the High Frontier. And it's about Gerard K. O'Neill. And, of course, we covered him on this podcast back on episode 35. But this, uh, this article has some wonderful images and uh, it's a great read, as you would expect from Emily. And your other article, Philestiest, was about Bill Pogue. And I really enjoyed that article. There's not a lot of writing about Bill Pogue, which is sad because he's written some really good books that I... Um I acquired recently as a gift, and I want to thank uh, the person who sent them over. But um, he wrote a really good autobiography. I hate to say it, like not many people are aware of it. I think it's called But for the Grace of God or something like that. Um, but if you can find it, I would recommend reading it. It's actually a, it's, it's a nice book, but it was fun to write about him because not a lot of people know about him. There's not a lot of biographical pieces about him. So I was glad to do that. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. So I hope everybody reads it. I think I think Bill Pogue's problem, Emily, is that he was on a, a flight called uh, Star Lab. Yeah, something like that. Four, I don't know. The fourth, the third or the... F I, I, it's confusing. It's just confusing. Uh, yeah. But it wasn't a very popular one. There was some kind of mutiny. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There was something, yeah, something, something like to that. Do with I that. don't know. I'm sure that's something the story. to do with that. I need to read I'm his sure book clearly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he does discuss that a little bit in his book, but the thing that gets me is like in all those books, it's like they all discuss it, but every, of course, the story got twisted. It's like whatever. Yeah. I think it's hysterical in a way because it's so crazy. But yeah, and um, yeah, I did another article this weekend about two other books, newer books. Uh, the first one is the Bruce McCandless. Uh, the third book, we had him on our show recently about Bruce McCandless the second. Great book. And um, wonderful book. I, I'm a little biased because uh, I, I, I I blurbed it. and I, Well, I'm a little biased about both books, I think, because I, I did blurb both books. But um, the other book is uh, In uh, the Light of Earth by uh, Al Warden and Francis French. It is coming out very soon. The first copies are starting to go out now. So if you order it now, you might get it in a few days. Both books are incredible. And it really they really do shed a lot of new light, pardon the pun, <laughs> upon like um, both of them. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of did a dual uh, review of them because the books discuss sort of their lives in the 70s, but not much was going on for either of them. And they weren't really happy about it. So I, I kind of took it from that perspective, but luckily both stories have happy endings. Yeah, I like the fact you uh, reviewed these two books together because there are similarities in the stories. Although I've not yet read Francis and Al Warren's new book because I haven't got it yet. I'm waiting for it to be delivered, uh, but I do love the Bruce McCann's book. Anyway, all the links for all these articles that Emily's written, she's been super busy, will be in the show notes as always. But I think we need to crack on. We've already done eight and a half minutes. So uh, let's get on with the show. Okay, we're off to a good start, Play it cool. In August of this year, a NASA Inspector General report highlighted that there were a number of reasons why the Artemis program might not make the 2024 target of getting the next person on the moon, and one of the main reasons is that their new spacesuit would not be ready in time. With that in mind, and with other stories about spacesuits over the last few years, it's clear that the general public doesn't know much about suits. So when I was at Space Fest, I asked Daniel Klopp if he would like to join us to talk a bit more about what is going on in the spacesuit world and to explain some basic things to us all. So Dan works for ILC Dover, which is the company which has been designing and manufacturing extravehicular activity suits, EVA, suits for NASA since the A7L suits for the Apollo program. Uh, right up to the EMU suit, which was the extravehicular mobility unit, or the EMU, used for spacewalks on the space shuttle and currently by NASA on the ISS. Uh, for those who are interested in the history of this, I would definitely recommend reading Lunar Outfitters, Making the Apollo Space Eater by Bill Airy, uh, who also used to work for ILC Dover. It's, it's a really incredible book, but right now we're talking to Daniel Klopp, and I think you're going to like this interview. Hi, here he comes, folks. Get the hammer out. And you ain't couldn't resist. 
Welcome, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us. I am a massive spacesuit nerd. Got the book and everything. Uh, so oh. I've, been, I've been really looking forward to this. <laughs> uh, I, I want to start with some basic questions, if that's okay, as I'm aware that a lot of our listeners perhaps haven't got into the depths of suit research that I have. So can you start by giving a brief and basic description of a pressure suit and the differences between that and an extravehicular activity suit used for spacewalks and moonwalks? Yes, uh, I would be happy to do that. There are two broad categories of things that people might consider a space suit. One is uh, what I've seen referred to as an IVA suit. I've also seen them referred to as LEA suits, as AES, ascent entry suits. They go by a bunch of different acronyms. These are pressure garments that are worn inside the vehicle, generally worn unpressurized, and they're sort of an emergency mechanism in case there's a rapid cabin depressurization during launch and during re-entry, which are the two most uh, dangerous parts of a space mission. So that's one category of, uh, of things that people would consider a spacesuit. And we've all seen uh, recently the SpaceX white suits. Those are in that category. Um, for those of us that are old enough to remember back to the space shuttle era, there were the orange bright orange suits. Uh, NASA called them the pumpkin suits. Uh, those are in that category as well. Now, a d completely different category of spacesuits are EVA spacesuits, extravehicular activity. This is a very intentional activity where the astronaut is leaving the spacecraft and going out to do some sort of extravehicular activity, whether it's going all the way back to the Apollo era, walking around on the surface of the moon, or in uh, more recent times, doing a spacewalk for some maintenance mission on the outside of the International Space Station. In that case, the suit is always worn pressurized, um, and it's you can think of it as a small spacecraft. It has to do everything for the duration of that spacewalk, um, and today's uh, spacewalks typically last uh, nominally six and a half to seven hours. Uh, so for the duration of that walk, that suit has to provide everything to keep the astronaut alive that would be provided normally inside the spacecraft when they were in orbit. We think of them as sort of a, a mini custom fit spacecraft. So how did ILC get involved with making suits for NASA? I believe that the company's uh, early designs didn't win the people over at NASA, but yet you guys somehow, uh, y'all somehow ended up with the contract? So um, going all the way back to... Uh, um, the or very early days of U.S. human space exploration, the Mercury suits were high-altitude pressure suits. Um, they were single astronaut in the capsule uh, in the Mercury mission, and those uh, astronauts never left the safety of the capsule. Then we transitioned into the Gemini era, two, two astronauts in the, in the capsule, and those were the first American spacewalks. Now, they were done on a tethered umbilical life support system. So the life support system was still inside the spacecraft. And uh, ILC Dover did not make either of those suits. Um, the first contract, as I understand the history, and I'm old, but I'm not that old, so I, I didn't, I didn't live, <laughs> live this history. But starting then in the Apollo era was the first set of, uh, or the first NASA requirements that ILC Dover bid upon. Because those suits, for the uh, Apollo missions required much higher mobility than the EVA suits that were used during the Gemini missions, where it was, uh, we call them spacewalks, but they're actually more of a space float. Um, <laughs> so there's not a whole lot of uh, mobility. They're not walking on anything when they uh, leave the, uh, the spacecraft in Earth orbit. So the NASA requirements for the suits to be used on the lunar excursions during the Apollo missions uh, required much higher mobility and ILC Dover had a unique design that provided that mobility. Now, because ILC Dover was such a small company, I understand there was some back and forth between the suit provider that had provided the suits for the Gemini missions, uh, which is a company uh, called David Clark, and ILC Dover, and uh, also the, the company that provides the life support systems, which today is known as Collins Aerospace, Back in the Apollo era, they were known as uh, Hamilton Standard. Uh, long story short, uh, what ended up 
is a combination of the Hamilton Standard uh, Life Support Backpack plus the ILC Dover um, spacesuit. And so we won that contract and we provided every EVA spacesuit to NASA from those first uh, lunar landing suits through the suits that are used today on the International Space Station. That's fantastic. So when people ask me about the Apollo program and why we can't just go back now and, and do it all over again, I always bring up the suits and the costs involved in making the suits. So do you know, I, there's there's often numbers floated around, but in, in today's money, or even what it cost back then, roughly how much did it cost to make an individual uh, Apollo spacesuit? And, and how many were needed for each mission, including the training suits and the backups? So the Apollo suits, uh, as I understand the history, um, there were essentially three suits made for every astronaut. And those suits in that era were all custom tailored to individual astronauts. Wow. So um, the individual astronauts would come to our facility in central Delaware to get measured and fitted for the suits. Actually, there is a, uh, a local watering hole, a local bar, not too far from our facility that still to this day, and I've actually been to the bar to check out the, uh, make sure that the, what, this wasn't just a myth. From Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on, every Apollo Air astronaut that walked on the moon has a signature on the wall of this bar. Wow. So it's uh, kind that's of a awesome. little uh, a little local uh, history that's uh, that's captured on the wall of a uh, of a local pub. Who would guess? <laughs> anyway, the uh, those Apollo astronauts would come to our facility and uh, get measured, as I said, and we would build them a primary suit, a backup suit, and a training suit. And those, as I say, were all absolutely custom tailored to the astronauts. Uh, as far as the cost of those suits, um, now these are late 1960, early 1970 dollars, so you have to kind of back out inflation. Uh, I believe those were in the range of uh, roughly two hundred thousand dollars each. I'm doing the math right now. <laughs> and okay, two thousand hundred thousand, nineteen sixty nine to um, that's a uh, wow. Roughly 1.5 million. All Jesus. right, so times three per crew member. So that's 4.5 million per crew member. So three crew Ooh. members, 9 million, <laughs> 13.5 million. Plus the backup crew will had, did they have all three suits or just uh, a, a main suit and a, and a training suit? Do we know that? It's a main suit and a training suit. So but a, a lot of times the backup crew would evolve into the next crew. So... You know, it's not sort of exactly one for one of uh, of how that all evolved. Um, but many but, millions. <laughs> yes, many, many millions on, on spacesuits. And uh, another piece of that that's, um, that's a nuance is there were actually two different types of suits that were made for the Apollo, for the three Apollo astronauts. There was a suit that was used for lunar excursion. And then there was a slight modification of that that was used by the command module pilot that stayed in orbit around the moon. It didn't have quite the mobility built into that suit um, that the uh, that the lunar excursion suits did. Um, so, and that suit was, uh, from what I understand, slightly less expensive to manufacture. And then there were there were actually two different generations. Then on top of that nuance <laughs> between the the two crew members and the or the two that were going to do the lunar excursion versus the command module pilot. Um, there was also a nuance over the course of the Apollo program. So from Apollo um, 11 through Apollo 14, um, they had one generation of suit. And then uh, Apollo 15, 16, and 17 had a different generation of suit that had even more mobility built specifically into the lower torso. Because if we'll remember back to those missions, those were the those last three Apollo landings, um, they included the lunar rover, the, the moon buggy. And so the suits had to accommodate a seating position um, in that lunar buggy. And so we had to make some modifications to, uh, to that generation of spacesuit. Wow. Sorry, I'm geeking out because I'm remembering <laughs> I was talking to Al Warden. God, I'm, br I'm dropping that like I was just talking about Warden a few years back, like all casual, like classic you Emily. Know, he just orbited the moon and stuff. But I was talking to him about something, and he pointed out, like, yeah, my suit wasn't. I didn't have as much dexterity as like you know Dave and Jim did because right. he was just the CMP, and 
just the CMP, but still, he was, <laughs> you know, all he had to do was uh, do the film, ca- you know, do the film canisters, and that was it. So his suit was different, but it never struck me to think about that before because I'm like, yeah, that would make sense because he wasn't having to bend and move as much. So that would make sense. Right. And those interesting uh, little tidbit is the, the three suits for the command module pilots in the last three mis- missions are the only suits that have done a deep space spacewalk in human wow. history because they did those spacewalks on the return trip from, uh, from the moon. And I remember reading something from Al Warden before he passed away. He said when he went out on that first deep space spacewalk, he looked one direction and saw the Earth way off in the distance, looked the other direction and saw the moon way off in the distance and realized I am in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) So that had to be uh, thrilling and at the same time, probably uh, a little nerve wracking. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Traffic, we read you loud and clear. And uh, for your info... Flipper got a visual on you, and he also picked up Surveyor. <laughs> so NASA has been using the same kinds of EVA suits. The it has the, you know the upper, the kind of rigid torso, and it bolts onto the bottom part. Um, they've been using those kind of suits for the last forty years or so. I think since nineteen eighty two or so. While these have worked well, um, what kinds of things? Now, as we transition, it's 2021. What kinds of things can be improved about that design? Yeah, let me talk about that, uh, the design of the EMU, which is the current suit. When we designed that suit, uh, one of the requirements for that, so that was designed back in the space shuttle era. Mm-hmm. And one of the requirements that NASA put as a requirement for uh, companies bidding on that contract was the ability of the suit to, or an astronaut in the suit, to be able to reach out and stop a spinning satellite or some other cargo that was in that large cargo bay of the uh, uh, of the space shuttle, if it had gotten out of control, oh wow, without doing any damage to their um, to their shoulder or to the spacesuit itself, endangering the astronaut. So, um, so that's what led to that rigid upper torso design, and that served us well since the space shuttle era. Uh, and there have been many modifications that we've made along the way. Uh, I think the most visible modification has been to the gloves. We've been through several different generations of uh, of gloves that mate to that same um, the same arms and the same hard upper torso. And also remember that that suit was only designed for a zero g environment, so it doesn't have a very mobile lower torso. So that suit would be uh, not well suited to go back to the moon because uh, it doesn't have a very mobile lower torso. It's got this hard upper torso, which, while it's incredibly strong, also adds a lot of mass to the suit. So in low Earth orbit, where you're in a zero-G environment, the weight of the suit is not important, uh, or not as important. I mean, you have a little bit of, uh, because of the momentum associated with the mass, you have a little bit of that to deal with, but it's not a big problem. Whereas when we go back to the moon, you're in a one-sixth G environment, so the suit does have weight at that point, and that design of the hard upper torso um, with the not very mobile lower torso is just completely uh, wrong for returning to the moon. So long-winded way of saying we're in the process of designing um, the next generation spacesuit, um, which in addition to a more mobile lower torso than we had in the Apollo program, we also have designed a much less massive upper torso to go with a much less massive uh, PLIS, the, the personal life support system, that's the, the, the life support backpack, nice. which Collins Aerospace, which back in the day was uh, was known as uh, Hamilton Standard, but uh, today they're known as Collins Aerospace, basically the same company. Um, they were, we're still in partnership with them, uh, as we were way back in the Apollo era, and we have been through the EMU era. Um, we're in partnership with them to design the next generation of spacesuits, and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, just last week, um, we did the first man pressurized test of the combination of the next gen spacesuit with the, the new lighter, um, less massive Collins Plus, and the test went absolutely spectacular. Amazing! That's great news. We had one of our suit techs in the suit to begin with last week, and he went through a, a, a bunch of uh, mobility and dexterity tests, uh, and then we put uh, a retired NASA astronaut 
in the suit and he went through the same things and despite his and he would kill me if he heard me saying this uh despite his uh, his advanced years he's uh, he just turned 60 um he was able to do some amazing things in the suit as well reach down and uh, touch his toes wow wow <laughs> and this is in a fully pressurized wow. suit that's hard no! for me to do and I, i'm just wearing you know sweatpants so yeah that's amazing <laughs> Oh, I have some incredible wow. video of the of this that uh, um, he was able to reach down, touch his toes, pick up a small object from the floor of our test lab, wow. reach back and touch his head, um, you know, on the top of his head. So there's just tremendous mobility in this uh, in this next gen um, spacesuit that That's we're designing. No awesome. way! Yeah, they couldn't do that back in the day. Not the name drop, but the astronaut is uh, Dan Burbank. Okay. Nice. That was doing these tests. For a second, I thought you were going to say, like, it's Jim Lovell. He's 92 and stuff <laughs> yeah. like that. And for a no. second, I was going to be like, wow, that is yeah. incredible. Because I'm 43 and I cannot touch my toes. So. I bet Charlie Duke can, though. He, uh, Charlie, Duke, <laughs> Charlie Duke is going to outlive, I think, all of us. So, yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. He's, he's, he's an ageless human being. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> Right, I have a few things to come back at here because uh, there was so much in that that was so good. So, um, number one, I've got a question about maintenance. Obviously, the, the suits that were in the shuttle were there for years, and the ones that are used in in the, on the ISS are the same same suits, right? Uh, oh, same basic design. Basic design. Yeah. How much maintenance do they need to go through from flight to flight, or or the ones that stay up there? How much maintenance do they do they get brought back every now and then, and and do you get them and then have to to repair them and things like that? Um, yes. Yeah. So each suit component. So unlike the Apollo era, where the suit was basically a one piece design. Now the helmet came off, the gloves came off, but the rest of the suit in the Apollo era was a one piece design. It was a rear entry suit, uh, so the the astronaut climbed in from the back of the suit. The current EMU suit is a modular design that's a waste entry design. So you, uh, to don the, the current EMU suit, you pull on the lower torso um, and then sort of climb underneath um, the upper torso, which is typically clipped into a donning stand, and sort of do this breaststroke swimming motion uh, to pull your arms through uh, and uh, pull up. And then the lower torso is clipped to the upper torso. Uh, the gloves are clipped on, and then the helmet is clipped on. And then the suit's uh, ready to be pressurized at that point. Uh, anyway, that uh, that suit is very modular. So the arms come off. They can be replaced with different length arms. Uh, we have different size lower torsos that go onto that. Many different size gloves. I think we're up to 64 different sizes of gloves wow. right now. Not um, just three. We make. Not just wow. three. No, that's the Orlon. The Russian Orlon suit only has three sizes of gloves. Yeah. Um, we're up to 64. Um, we actually just uh, added the 64th size not too long ago uh, because a new astronaut, uh, Jasmine, uh, I forget her last name, uh, just coming into the program now. Um, happens to have unusually long, skinny fingers, and she tried on uh, various sizes of uh, of gloves that she thought might fit, and none of them were a perfect fit. So we're up to 64 sizes of gloves now because we made a custom si set uh, for uh, for Jasmine. But that's the most customized piece. But anyway, back to your question, Dave, of suit maintenance. Each suit component has a rated lifetime for that component. Right. And so various components will go up to the, the shuttle and get assembled um, with the other components that are there. Um, and components will come back from orbit and we may refurb those. Um, a lot of the training suits that are used in the neutral buoyancy lab are actually assembled from components that have um, exceeded their or have met their rated lifetime for use in space. But because oh, wow. it's inherently a safer environment in the NBL, in the neutral buoyancy lab, they get sort of recycled, if you want to think of it that way, into a training suit then uh, used in the neutral buoyancy lab to train uh, future astronauts. The, the other thing I wanted to bring up, obviously, this new suit, which is all singing, all dancing, they can bend, touch their toes, incredible. Um, I'm looking forward to wearing one because then I'll be able to touch my toes. Amazing. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I have two questions about, about that suit. Number one, there's a lot of talk about it being delayed. Is that the suit that, that everyone's talking about? 
they're even saying is the reason why Artemis is going to be delayed. Is that because of that suit or is that a different suit? And the second part to that is, are those suits like the Apollo ones going to be custom fitted or is it going to be more modular like uh, the current EMU, which enables you to mix and match parts compared f- for the astronaut? Okay, let me take those questions one at a time. The first question is, uh, is the suit that I was describing just a few minutes ago, the same suit uh, that made the press uh, I don't know, about three, four weeks ago when there was a lot of uh, popular press because of the release of the Office of Inspector General's report that the suit that, uh, that was being developed was over budget and, uh, and not on time. Um, that is not the suit that we're developing. Right. So that was a, a different development effort that was going on inside of NASA. Um, we've been doing, independent of that, we've been doing our own suit development uh, that's been going on for several years now. And one of the reasons that we did the demo we did last week to demonstrate this is to be able to demonstrate to NASA that we are almost ready to go. I mean, we have to do some more qualification testing, but if NASA chooses a suit that we're developing in combination with Collins, we will be ready far in advance of any other part of the Artemis missions. That's awesome. I love that. that. That's awesome. Okay. So that's and that's being developed with uh, with private R and D dollars. So it's not on a NASA. We aren't doing that development on a NASA development contract. We've uh, spent our own company money on doing that suit development. And one of the reasons that we've gone down that path is the commercialization of space. We believe we're going to be able to sell that suit not only to NASA but to other private of entities course, of course. Um, someday. So it uh, from that standpoint, it made it uh, it made us be able to assemble a business case for spending our own R&D dollars because we'll potentially have more customers for that uh, that suit. Of course, of course. So I'm guessing it is more the modular design then. That's kind of yep. answered my question and because... Exactly. And I was going to add even more to the modular design. So in addition to carrying over um, the modularity that we, um, that we designed into that EMU suit, we've also added resizability. Which, wow. because of the hard upper torso in the current EMU suit, and I explained all the reasons why that was a design requirement, uh, but uh, this next gen suit, um, that's no longer a requirement, we believe. But, you know, we don't, still don't have the final specifications from NASA for the, the next generation suit, but we believe that won't be a requirement. Um, so, we've designed a, a different style of upper torso, um, which sort of combines the, the best of the hard upper torso that was from the EMU era with the soft upper torso from way back in the Apollo era. And we've designed something that we're calling a hybrid upper torso. And the advantage that that brings us is extreme resizability. So the ability within just a few minutes with no tools required, so it could be done on orbit or in a lunar lander, um, to resize the same suit to fit an incredibly wide range of human beings. What we're shooting for is with two different sizes of upper torsos, being able to cover from the first percentile human up to the 99th percentile human. That's, That's just awesome. insane. It's just insane. Maybe I could actually walk on the moon then. That would be <laughs> awesome because I'm really small. So yeah, that would be nice. Yes, I've, I've, I've seen you in person, Emily. And yes, we are designing for somebody even shorter than you. Oh my gosh. What about us tall folk? <laughs> yeah, what about Dave? <laughs> six foot five. That's always been my issue, that I wouldn't fit in one. Oh, you're six five. Yeah. Ooh, you're a little outside the range. Right? Um, it, it turns out the 99th percentile of human uh, from the anthropomorphic measurements that, uh, that we've seen is six foot four. Oh, <laughs> I think I'm six four and a half. What you need to do, what you need to do is, um, like, I think Jack Lausma told us he was like an inch over. One time, so he, had, I think he jumped all night or did something to compress his spine, so he would be, so he would be like five twelve. Amazing, that's so amazing. he wouldn't be six one. He would be like right. just at the cutoff. So try doing well, that. I'm, I'm six foot two, and I've gotten into an upper torso just barely, but there's no lower torso that's big enough in the current EMU. Wow, to uh, for for me to get in. So I'm looking forward to getting in uh, one of these next generation suits myself. Amazing, amazing. Well, I'm a bit gutted about that, but anyway, I'll I'll live. I'm sure. Um, So 
that the, the the fact you talked about the idea of selling these on to some of the private firms, um, I, I'm wondering whether you at ILC Dover had a hand in consulting for SpaceX or in any any of the other commercial contractors in their suit designs, or is is, is that something they were all do, try attempting in house? Because it seems to me, with your wealth of experience, it, it'd be silly not to. So SpaceX talked to us and understand that historically we have not participated in the launch entry suit. Right. Um, That's been uh, our major U.S. competitor in that arena, and we've put in some proposals for some various generations of NASA contracts, but we've never won that style of spacesuit. That said, we are building now um, launch entry suits and talking to many potential customers and I'm under NDA, so I can't mention them, but <laughs> we can all imagine who they might be. Um, the, the biggest names in the aerospace uh, industry that are planning um, various launch vehicles, the various space stations, those sort of things. Uh, we are going to be very soon uh, entering that uh, launch entry suit end of the spacesuit market as well. That's awesome. Yeah. So those of you listening, you know, bemoaning the state of space flight, don't worry. The future's, the future's coming. Okay, what is, <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble, but what is your personal favorite spacesuit? It could be any kind of suit there is. It could be for functionality or aesthetics, whatever. What's your favorite? This is such a dumb question, but I'm just curious. Well, uh, so it's an easy question for me to answer, having just come off um, a week in our Houston facility where we were doing this uh, test that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's our next generation spacesuit. Cool. Uh, which we've uh, we've dubbed Astro is a, uh, a a trademark name that we are, are applying to that suit. So the mobility and uh, ease of donning and doffing and resizability of that suit is just spectacular. So it's 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 hard to say that anything else would be my favorite at this point. Uh, one other thing that we've designed into this suit is the ability to um, to make two different versions of it. One is a rear entry version, um, which could be adapted to the suit port design, uh, depending on what NASA decides to do with the next set of uh, lunar missions. And we also can make a waist entry version of it. So, um, so we can use, we expect this suit to not only be the next boots on the moon, but to also be a replacement for the current EMU on the ISS. And then as we evolve to uh, the, the next generation of space stations beyond the ISS, um, the suit uh, with a different lower torso would be uh, um, than we would use for the the lunar version of it. Um, we could adapt the suit easily to uh, uh, to fulfill a zero g mission as well. Wow! So it's sort of like the the twenty first ver- century version of uh, the A seven L suit. Yes, it's the the uh, the Swiss Army knife of uh, uh, yes. of space suits. Yeah. Because I always thought, honestly, I mean, and I'm I, I'm not a spacesuit expert. I, I I compared to Dave, I'll be honest, I know very little about spacesuits. But um, I always thought the A7L was a great was a great design. I mean, I just I always thought because there was so much functionality with it. I'm like, man, why can't we do something like that now? And it looks like that's what you guys are doing, which is, but it's uh, it's a a lot better than the A7L, which is awesome. Yeah, a few exactly. few extra steps, a few further, few few little bits of development, just a few. <laughs> yeah, it's like a like a super amped up version of the A7L. <laughs> yes, exactly, and and certainly um, advancements in material science uh, done by materials development companies have aided in our, um, you know, we've been able to incorporate uh, newer materials, less massive and stronger materials uh, into this new design. Uh, which has all aided us then in providing this additional mobility beyond what the Apollo era suits were were able to provide. Yeah, fantastic, absolutely. Which which has got me onto one other thing. Do you have to consider about radiation at all? Yes. Um, so uh, the outer layer of the suit uh, is, uh, as you probably know, is called the TMG, mm-hmm. the thermal micrometeoroid garment. So the the main purpose of that outer layer is to filter out. Uh, radiation, potentially harmful radiation, uh, as well as provide intrusion protection for micrometeoroids. So I, I think of it as kind of a uh, a intense UV bulletproof vest. Nice. Kind of. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> amazing amazing well wow. dan thank you so much for joining us this has been incredible this is everything i wanted it to be and more so thank you so much it's been great yes, getting some you. insights and uh, and thank you for uh, explaining all about suits to our to our listeners it's been great i've been uh, happy to be to be aboard here So we recorded that interview on the 21st of September, and since then, there have been some interesting developments in the spacesuit world. On September 29th, NASA formally published a request for proposal for companies to compete for the agency's future purchase of spacesuits for the International Space Station, Artemis, and Gateway. This means that the suit Dan was talking about will be formally presented to NASA for their consideration. As a result, ILC Divers partners in this suit, Collins Aerospace, have uploaded a fantastic video about this new suit on 1st of October. And we'll be putting a link to this video in the show notes. And it's definitely worth looking at because it, it's amazing. You can get to see exactly what Dan was on about. Uh, and it, it features Nicole Stott, for example, who's a, we, we'd like to call her a friend of the podcast now. Uh, so uh, that, that, it's a great video. You have to watch it. But Emily, what did you think about that interview? I'll be honest. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit this. I, I, I'm one of those people. Unfortunately, I, I, I don't know a lot about pressure suits and space suits as much as I should. By this point, I've read very little about it. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it because at this point I should have read a lot more about it. But uh, I think uh, Dan made me feel infinitely smarter because he really filled in the blanks for me about a lot of questions that I had. So that was really fun. And also, uh, I can't wait to see those new suits on the moon. Oh, my God. Those new suits. They just sound incredible, don't they? Yeah. I mean, it's like I said... uh, um, uh, in the interview, it, it sounds sort of like, I'm sure they look a lot more modern, but they sound like sort of a, you know, the 21st century version of A7L, except more dexterity than the A7L yeah. suits, because, you know, looking at those suits, they're, they're still awesome. They're, they definitely have an iconic look about them because they're associated with Apollo, but I'm sure, you know, obviously they've improved on it a thousand percent, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. It was one of those ones, Emily, when when you decide to do a more technical interview, it could be really boring and dull, but it wasn't at all. I was I was fascinated. I know I'm interested in it, but I was watching your reactions as well. And it was just fascinating, wasn't it? Yes. I'm really happy we had that interview. So thanks for uh, thanks for arranging that one, Emily. That was really great. No problem. I'm I'm really uh, yeah. I met Dan at a uh, space fest. He was there with uh, Bill Airy. I think I'm saying his name right. Airy. I believe so. Uh, yeah, that's how I would say that. And uh, he was there, and I I I went to their uh, booth, and I was just like, man, we got to get them on the show because uh, there's just so much to talk about. There's the past. There's what they're doing now, and there's hopefully what we're gonna see in a few years on the moon. Um, that'll be real exciting. I can't wait to see one of those new suits in action. That's why I can't wait to see you in one of those suits in action. Yes! Yes! <laughs> yes! Anyway, as always, you can watch the full unedited video of the interview over on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. And details about ILC Dover and Dan can be found within the show notes. Okay, Jiminy 8, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and talk. And so on to this week's news. And at the point of recording this podcast on the evening of Tuesday, the 12th of October, there have not been any launches since our last podcast, which may be a first since we started doing this, Emily. I can't think of too many weeks where that's been the case. Exactly. There's There's been a lot going on the last, oh my God. Year and a half. Almost year yeah. and a half. There's been a ton going on. Uh, but on Wednesday, October 13th, a Blue Origin New Shepard launch should hopefully be taking place. So by the time this has been released, uh, that may have occurred. Uh, taking the crew of Chris uh, Boschutian, I think I said his name right, Glenn DeVries, Audrey Powers, and William Shatner. Yes, that William Shatner <laughs> on a suborbital trip to space. If this takes place, then I'm sure Dave will post the video in the show notes. If it doesn't, we will talk about it more next week. Yeah, right now we're both sitting here just hoping it goes well. If it happens... 
Please, please go well. Exactly. That's all I care about. Exactly. Uh, it also looks like there's going to be quite a few launches coming up over the next week or two, including the next Chinese crew launch and the launch of the Lucy spacecraft, which is heading on a 12-year journey to visit at least eight different asteroids, a mission which we're going to have to cover in more detail because it's crazy, and the crew free launch on a new SpaceX Dragon capsule, which will be called Endurance. Exciting times. Yeah, 12 years. I don't even want to think about when that ends, how how gray I'm going to be. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. my God. I, yeah, when I go to, uh, when I go and get my hair cut, by the time that comes back and I say, can I have a haircut, please? The guy's going to be saying, which one? Exactly. Like, exactly. Well, with me, it'll be like, you know, it'll be like, oh, wow, you're, you know, you're platinum. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> no, that's not platinum. Somebody said that to me once when I got my hair cut and I started dyeing my hair immediately. Oh, so, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to die. I was like, that's not platinum butthole. But anyway, um, <laughs> however, uh, Boeing have announced that the test launch of their Starliner spacecraft, which was supposed to happen in early August, now won't happen until early 2022. Uh, you may remember us talking about this. The rocket was on the pad and it looked like it might launch, but some pre-launch tests highlighted an issue with some valves in the service module. I'm sure this is all very frustrating to those involved. Um, as a result of this, NASA has reassigned two astronauts from Starliner to SpaceX's Crew Dragon. Nicole Mann and Josh Casada will join the Crew 5 mission, which will be expected to fly no earlier than the autumn of 2022, and that will be the first flight for both of those astronauts. Experienced astronauts Butch Wilmore, Michael Fink and Sunita Williams will remain on the manifest for future Starliner flights for now. Meanwhile, on Mars, photos taken by the Perseverance rover have confirmed the interpretation of photos from the Mars orbiters that Jezero Crater used to be the home of a big lake and a river delta. There was a new study in the journal called Science, where researchers analysed the photos which Percy sent back from its mast cam uh, before it even started driving around. And as a result of these photos, some Scientists are satisfied that Percy is in the best spot to find any signs of life that might have once existed on the planet. And while we're talking about scientific discoveries, the rocks that the Shang-E 5 spacecraft managed to return from the moon last December have been analyzed by scientists, and it seems that they are a billion years younger than the rocks and dust brought home by the Apollo program. Uh, the reason that this is a big discovery is because they are a type of basalt, which only forms during volcanic eruptions. And that now means we have evidence that lava was flowing on the moon a billion years later than previous evidence showed. But when talking about change, what's what's a billion years here or there? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's crazy though, isn't it? I mean, they, that, that is. to be in a gap in the knowledge that was that big. They didn't know what was going yeah. on for like a billion and a half years. It's crazy. And we just found it out now, yeah. like after, you know, Almost 50 years of Apollo, so... Crazy. Anyway. That is nuts. And finally, I also think it's worth letting you know that there is a new documentary on Disney Plus called Among the Stars, uh, which follows a two-year quest to replace some cooling pumps on the failing cosmic ray detecting equipment on the ISS. Uh, this six-part documentary looks like it's centred around astronaut Chris Cassidy, and I will post the trailer in the show notes. I've not watched it yet, but I do intend on doing so very soon. So if you have seen it, We'd love to know your opinions on it. When people put their minds to it, they can make things happen extraordinarily fast. The whole Apollo project was not even 10 years from the start of the concept to the successful realization. Almost anything that's technically within present possibility can be done within a 10 year time span when people set their minds to it. So before we end, I just have a few thank yous, which I'd like to do personally, if that's all right. Uh, firstly, Don Irwin sent me a, a, a signed Fred Hayes Apollo 13 patch. Oh, wow. That's I know. wonderful. One of our listeners. Thank you so much, Don. This arrived this thank week. Thank you, Don. That's so that is awesome. Yeah. I was like, yeah. what? This is amazing. And it is weird you mention that because I swear that this is kind of creepy. I actually had a dream about Fredo last night. It was a nice dream. He wasn't, it wasn't, <laughs> he didn't turn into evil Fredo or anything. I, I know it's Halloween season. Yeah, he didn't turn into like Fredo Krueger or anything like that. Oh, nice. You nice. Know? But no, I actually had a dream about Fredo last night. Uh, I dreamt that he was teaching me how to fly a, 
fly planes and i was like i don't want to fly a plane in front of you because you're fred hayes like you're the <laughs> one of the greatest of all time like i'm That's gonna amazing. screw up bad <laughs> you know i'm gonna screw up and you're gonna laugh and you're gonna be like dog she's horrible you know so that was the whole dream but yeah so that was what i dreamt about he was very nice obviously in the dream i don't think any i don't think my subconscious could make him you know evil fred hayes or anything like that you know like bizarro freddo but it was really cool. That's amazing. Anyway, it, it's a lovely gift, and thank you, Don. And also, it's, it's in aid of the Infinity Center in Mississippi. That, so that's also a wonderful thing to, to have done. Um, but yeah, also, I, I mean, I haven't spoken about this too much, but I'm recording now in January in Abbey Road, and I posted some things on my social media about it, and people have been very generous over the last couple of weeks. And, and I appreciate anyone who has checked out what I'm trying to do there and has, uh, and has donated or purchased something from me for that, because... Uh, it's it's coming around very quick and it's quite intimidating. Yes. Um, yeah, January is coming up pretty yeah, soon, yeah. which is freaky because I'm like, wasn't it just 2020 like I a know. minute ago? What the heck? I you know. know. Crazy. Um, and uh, yeah, I think when listeners of this podcast find out my plans for the content of this album, they're going to quite like it. That's all I'm going to say for now. Um, but yeah. Because uh, it hasn't happened yet I might get it all wrong But uh, that's the plan So that's it for this week We'll be back with something else next week But we hope that you've learned about the world of spacesuits Thank you to all who continue to share the podcast It's really helping us out Yeah, exactly If uh, if everyone who listens gets one extra person to listen Then we'll have twice as many listeners <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess that's a bit obvious Sorry <laughs> No, it's okay It reminds me of Oh my God. I don't even want to tell this story. <laughs> this reminds what you just said reminds me of a sort of a story. Uh, oh my God. It's <laughs> terrible. It's one of my only songwriting endeavors in my life. What? I wrote a, yeah, me and a friend wrote a song. If everybody gave me a dollar, I'd be rich. <laughs> well, that's true. It that's is true. true. <laughs> it is true. Yeah. Thankfully, this never got recorded. Thank oh, I wish God. it did. I wish it did. <laughs> Maybe I'll do it again. Who yeah. knows? <laughs> we'll reunite. Yeah, Space right. Fest 2022 featuring Emily yeah. Carney. Sing it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> if everyone gave me a dollar, I'd be rich. <laughs> yeah. Inspirational tune. Inspirational. <laughs> so moving on, uh, please don't forget, in space, no one can hear you meme. <laughs> Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.